And now, tonight's presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Tonight, we bring you one of the great mysteries of the sea, a ship found drifting in perfect condition, but with no human aboard. We call it the mystery of the Mary Celeste. So now, starring John Daner, here is tonight's suspense play, The Mystery of the Mary Celeste. On December 9th, 1872, the American brigantine Mary Celeste was discovered adrift and derelict close off the coast of North Africa. She had sustained some storm damage, but she was still an able ship. Her sails were set, her cargo was intact, conditions in her cabins and forecastle seemed normal. There was no evidence of violence. Yet not a sign was found of the crew that had manned her. Officers, men, and the captain's wife had vanished and no acceptable explanation of their disappearance has ever been advanced. Perhaps this is that story. It would start in New York City's Harbor District on the night of November 7th, 1872, the eve of the Mary Celeste's departure from that same harbor. This way. No, I didn't see anybody. I heard the shots. Uh, who is this you're after? He just killed some people. <laughs> what? Thought I heard something. Uh, but I don't now. Who did the man kill? A young girl. And the man she was with. And then he killed the girl's mother. He's a maniac that we've got to get. I'll look down this way. Well, I'll help if I can. All right. Four men from the force will be here shortly. I didn't remember killing her mother. Grace I killed because I couldn't help it. The man because he came after me when Grace was down. But I never meant to kill her mother. And when I heard that I had, I wondered if the officer was right. And then I was insane. There was not time to think of it then. Only time to think of getting away. And through that night, I searched for a ship that was leaving soon. And one that was badly guarded so I could slip aboard. When I found her, she was the Mary Celeste. And the drunken deck watch stayed in his sleep until I was hidden in number two hold. There I passed two days in a dream. Neither fully awake nor asleep, but always thinking of the horror I had done. And I knew that escape was wrong... And then I could never be sane until I cleared my soul of it. On the third morning, I proceed to make my presence aboard known so that I can go to the captain and tell him of my crime and take the consequences I so richly deserve. I climb to the deck and am immediately seen by a crewman. Lily, look. Who's that? Who are you, mister, and what are you doing aboard? My name is Sam Newcomb, and I want to talk to your captain. You'll talk to him right enough, whether you want to or not. How'd you get on board? You'll be lucky if you didn't stand the 12 to 4 watch your last night in port, because that's when it was. You're uppity for a stowaway, aren't you? You're no better than a thief. I admit that. I want no trouble with you. Please, take me to the captain. I'll talk to him and no one else. Uh, You take him, Bowl. I'd better stay forward. Come on, Newcomb. You're going to make the rest of the trip with us. You better drop your airs or there'll be trouble. I don't have any airs. And I don't think you'll be troubled with my company. Oh, 
Oh, you mean you don't think you'll quarter with a crew? No. You expect to be with the officers like an honored guest? No. Where then? I don't know. You act like you're deaf. <laughs> don't you say that. I don't... You what? Nothing. I'm sorry, I want to talk to you, Captain. You watch what you do or say, you'll be over the side. Here. Yes, come. Watch your language. The skipper's wife is in the next cabin aft. Well, who's this? He just came out of number two hole, sir. His name's Sam Newcomb. Got aboard on the 12 to 4 watch hour last night in. Hubbard's watch. He'll answer for it. Well, Newcomb, what do you have to say for yourself? Well, I'd like it if I could talk to you alone, sir. Well, that's all, Bowl. Tell Hubbard I'll want to see him as soon as he's off watch. Yes, sir. You uh, realize, Newcomb, that you've committed a crime by boarding this ship without permission. And probably without passport or any other papers, I suppose. I know, sir, but when I tell you why... Now, I'm not a bad man, sir. Nothing like this ever happened before, but something drove me. I, I didn't know what I was doing. Another one who's always wanted to go to sea, I suppose. Oh, no, sir. I've been sailing for ten years. I'm an able hand. I came aboard because... I had to get away. You're in trouble? Yes, sir. I don't think it was my fault, but... Oh, I am wrong. What kind of trouble? Well, there was a girl, sir, who I was in love with. I don't know what came over me, but... Yes? What'd you do to her? I found her with another man, and... I just had to get away, sir. Ah, lovesick, eh? Well, that doesn't condone... Oh, oh, yes, my dear. Oh. I'm sorry. I thought I heard you talking. Yes, yes. This is uh, Mr. Newcomb. He came aboard illegally the night before we left. Well, where has he been? It's three days. In number two hold, ma'am. Have you had food and water? No, ma'am. Why haven't you come to us before this? I don't know, ma'am. He was going to tell me why he came aboard. I don't suppose it's important to anyone but me. I felt that I had to get away and... It was a girl. I almost guessed that. A broken heart? I thought it was. I know it sounds silly, but to me it seemed awfully serious, and I couldn't think of another way to leave as quickly as I wanted to. Yes, yes. Well, there's no way I can allow an affair of the heart to influence what I must do in this case. By reputation, I'm a fair and lenient man. Well, I'm a seaman, uh, sir. I could work my way. I'm not so sure you deserve the chance. Whatever you say, sir. Ben. Oh, please, Grace. Grace? What's the matter with you? Nothing, sir. My name. Grace is the name of the girl. Yes, ma'am. It was learning that the captain's wife was aboard that made me change my mind about telling him the truth. When I talked to him, especially after his wife came, everything was turned about. It was as though I was the captain and the stowaway was someone else. It was as though my wife, my Grace, had come in from the next cabin and together we talked to this stowaway. And we felt sorry for him and wanted to be kind to him. The wife can't be more than three or four years older than I. And I feel close to her right away. I think that even if she doesn't know what I've done, she understands me. It is a good feeling to have one friend on the ship. Through her, please, I am sure I am not restrained and instead sent to take my place with the crew in their forecastle. doing here? Couldn't you find a better place to quarter? I was told where to come. Uh, Hubbard. Uh. Wake up. 
Here's the one came aboard during your watch. Huh? What did you figure you'd be fined, Hubbard? A week's pay? Yeah, that's right. Newcomb, huh? Yes. Why'd you come aboard? I wanted to get away from New York. Man's got to have a better reason than that. Are you running away from the police? No. What then? That I wouldn't interest you. It's not important. It's important to me. And I want you to know how I feel about it. Oh! 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 <laughs> Are you going to get up? No. I want no trouble with any of you. You don't want any trouble. You caused uh, me trouble, haven't you? I'll be called up in front of the captain because of you. That's done. There's no way I can change it. We got three weeks before we make Naples. You'll pay for it. I'll see to that. Through the following days, I knew no peace. There were four deckhands and a first officer, and although I had reason to fight because of the way they beat me and used me, I did not. I was afraid of my own violence now that I had killed. The one named Hubbard was the worst. His eyes were always on me, and I wondered why. There was a night when I woke to find him bending over my bunk. He was smiling, and from that moment on, even in sleep, I felt him watching me. On another night, I am on deck. I'm crossing from port to starboard. And when I pass under the main yard, a marlin spike falls from aloft and sticks in the planks beside me, narrowly missing my head. I look up to see Hubbard smiling down at me from the rigging. I try to avoid him, but he drops to the deck to face me. I dropped my spike. I know you did. What are you going to do about it? Nothing. <laughs> You take more than any man I've ever known, Newcomb. I'm not proud of that. But why do you keep after me? Why don't you leave me alone? Because I'm a curious man. I want to know truly why you're on this ship. Your story to the captain about trouble with some woman just doesn't set right. It's the truth. Not all of it. Why do you say that? Anybody ever tell you you talk in your sleep? You are listening to The Mystery of the Mary Celeste. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. We all have treasured possessions, keepsakes, and mementos which are irreplaceable regardless of cost. You'd be heartsick if you lost yours, yet probably you are risking their loss by fire every day through carelessness. So CBS Radio reminds you, don't give fire a place to start. Be sure all cigarettes are out before discarding them. Clear your house of old newspapers, damaged furniture, and inflammable de debris. Repair electrical wiring as soon as it shows signs of wear. These simple rules will keep your valuables safe. They could even save your life. And now we bring back to our Hollywood soundstage, John Daner, starring in tonight's production, The Mystery of the Mary Celeste, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. <laughs> I had never been told that I talked in my sleep until the one named Hubbard said I did. He may have been lying, but I could not chance that. Therefore, I carefully abstained from regular sleeping habits, allowing myself short naps only when I knew that Hubbard was at the helm or some other ship's business that he could not leave. 
The horror that I had done became a secret that pressed against my head, wanting escape. But I held it in, and I took the abuse of the men aboard. The only kindness and relaxation I find are during the moments when I chance to meet the captain's wife. Off watch one night, when it is not safe to sleep, I am alone, taking a cup of tea in the galley when she comes in. Oh, Mrs. Briggs. Why, Mr. Newcomb, I've been thinking of you. I haven't seen... Well, you look ill. Is something wrong? Nothing, ma'am. Oh, my sleep has not been so good. And your cheek is bruised. Huh? Oh. What happened? No, nothing serious. Some trouble with the other hands. Have you told the captain? No, no, ma'am. Why not? I shall. No, please, don't. I've caused enough trouble. I wouldn't want there to be any more. May I have some tea, Mr. Newcomb? Oh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. I think you're a very kind man, Mr. Newcomb. Oh, you do? Yes. To protect the other hands, for one thing. They're a rough lot, I know. No, no worse than most men, ma'am. You're very unhappy, aren't you? This girl, Grace. I, I know this is hard for you to understand, but really, no one girl is worth ruining your life for. Not even losing sleep for. Yes, ma'am. I wish you'd stop calling me ma'am. Perhaps if you did, you could talk to me about this girl. I think it would do you good, don't you? I don't know. Tell me about her. I'm sure she's quite beautiful. Well, I thought so. And you planned to be married? Yes. But she changed her mind. Well, she was never sure. She was ambitious for me. Oh, that's natural. And I disappointed her like I did my family, my mother, everybody. I'm always thinking that I'm doing my best, but I always disappoint people. But what did she want you to be, this girl? Oh, a ship's master like your husband. We dreamed of the day she could sail with me like you do on this ship. You mustn't lose faith in yourself. It took my husband years to get his papers. There are no years for me anymore. She wouldn't wait. No, she wouldn't wait. You must have waited, but she wouldn't. She promised to wait, but she didn't. She never understood that it took time. She was ambitious, and she pushed me for my officer's papers, and I failed. My family pushed me, too, when I wasn't ready, and they made me fail. And I went away, a six-month trip to South America. I tried to jump overboard, and they stopped me. And I got back and found her married to a ship's captain. And her mother was there, laughing at me. I tried to tell them that I was happy about it. Then Grace smiled at me, and something happened. Mr. Newcomb. I was only going to kill her. I didn't even know the others were there. I hit her, and when she went down, the man came after me, and I hit him, too. And when you get in a mix-up like that, you just don't know what you're doing, and... Time means nothing. It's like everything else. Mr. Newcomb, and then her I... mother. I don't remember that. But she's dead, too, and then they blame me. Maybe I did. Miss Briggs, where are you going? Stay away from me. Oh, no, you've been nice to me. Why did it have to be you that I told everything? <laughs> no, please, please. And I like you. Why did it have to be you? No, no, no. No, I don't want to kill you. I never wanted to kill anybody. Just let me go. No, please, I won't hurt you. you you've been nice to me. Stay away from me. I won't touch you. I won't touch you. But you've got to promise. You won't tell. I don't know why I said those things. They are true. I, I, I get mixed up. I dream things and then they seem real after I wake up. <laughs> That's why I'm such a liar. I always lie. Nothing I told you was the truth. Nothing. Do you believe that? Yes. And yes. You won't tell anybody what I said? I... I won't tell anyone. Oh, I'm glad. Now, come, Mrs. Briggs, finish your tea. We'll... we'll talk about something else. No. No, I... I've got to go to my cabin. Mrs. Briggs! Don't tell... I 
knew she would tell, and so I hid. I went back to number two hole where I had felt safe before. I don't know how much time passed. There they find me. I see their lantern as they come closer. The truth is out, and there is no place for me to go. So I stand up and wait. I hear him, I think. Yes, Hubbard. Keep your pistol ready. We'll have to be careful. Yes, sir. There he is, sir. Come out of there, Nogum. Keep your lantern down, Hubbard. Keep us out of the light. He's dangerous. I, I won't cause any trouble, sir. Get him out of there. I won't cause any trouble, yes. sir. It's all right, sir. He's down. The dirty scum. Lock him up. I am not sure how many days passed, but I found comfort in being locked up because I could sleep without the fear of Hubbard leaning over me, listening for what I might say. Then there was one night when shouting on deck woke me up. I couldn't hear the words being in the middle of the ship, but soon the shouting stopped, and there was silence. It was a new silence that I studied for a long time. I heard no footsteps on the deck. I heard no voices. I heard no creaking timbers. It was a dead ship. I wait for the one daily meal that they allow me. No one comes. And then I shout. Let me out! Let me out of here! Somebody come! Let me out! If one were insane, he would surely break at a moment like that. I was locked up and alone on a ship that was held motionless as if gripped by some great hand but I did not break. I dismantled my bunk and from the wood and fashioned a ram with which I attacked the door. The task of freeing myself consumed most of the day, and such was my concentration that I didn't realize the exact moment that the ship began moving, as if the great hand had released its grip and set her free. And I was free. I come out on deck to find a cloudless sky and empty sea horizons all around, as if I am alone in the world. The wheel spinning idly with no one to attend it. I lash it after fitting a new course to the sail she is wearing. The whole ship is mine. I am master and crew. And I have found peace and well-being as if I've been absolved of any wrongs I ever did. Because what, if not Providence, held the ship that night and sent the others to certain death in the endless sea? What, if not kind Providence, decided that I, I alone would survive? The meek and humble shall inherit the earth. This narrative I swear to be true. And on this second day of December, the year of our Lord, 1872, I hereby sign it and seal it in a bottle to be delivered to the ocean currents in the hope that someday it will drift back to the hated world from which I am forever parted. According to scientific theory, a strange phenomenon takes place now and again off the coast of Africa near where the Mary Celeste was found. Great rivers of sand are swept out from the coastal deserts. When certain conditions prevail, this sand is concentrated by the ocean currents. Millions of tons are massed until an island is born, lives briefly, 
and then is swept away by a shift in the currents that created it. One such island, formed under a small ship during World War II, held it for a number of hours, then released it, much in the same manner that Sam Newcomb's Providence acted. A like occurrence could have caused the abandonment of the Mary Celeste, but no one knows. According to some reports, Sam Newcomb's signed confession did drift ashore many years later. If that is true, perhaps another of the many mysteries surrounding the Mary Celeste has been solved. That mystery was a short length of line that reportedly was found secured to the stern of the ship, close up under the transom where someone would hide. Attached to this line was a man's leather belt that had parted in the middle. Could Sam Newcomb have hidden there when the salvage crew was put aboard to sail the ship to Gibraltar? Could he have hung suspended there against the weakening belt until it parted and let him sink silently into the sea? Suspense, in which John Daner starred in tonight's presentation of The Mystery of the Mary Celeste. Next week, the story of a murder plan that was discovered and which led to a double execution. We call it The Eavesdropper. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Anthony Ellis. Tonight's script was written by Gil Dowd. The music was composed by Lucian Morawieck and Rene Garrigan and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Featured in the cast were Victor Perrin, Joseph Kearns, Paul Fries, Ben Wright, Joe Duvall, and Helen Klebe. Have you heard any good Geiger counters lately? Better stick to the ones you own. The latest dodge of the lads in the lookout for easy money is to hold up a Geiger counter until any old used bricks make like solid uranium. Tomorrow night, our FBI in Peace and War tackles a slick confidence man with a rigged Geiger counter and a fistful of beautifully engraved uranium stock certificates. Be sure to meet the FBI in Peace and War on most of these same CBS radio stations tomorrow night. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed on most of these same stations by The Jack Carson Show. You hear America's favorite shows on the CBS radio network.